Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. half talking to herself and half asleep. The kitten had been having a grand game of romps with a ball of worsted Alice had been trying to wind up. Oh, you wicked, wicked little thing. Really, Dine ought to have taught you better manners. You're not good directly. Kitty, I'll put you through into Looking Glass House. How would you like that? Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could get through into Looking Glass House. I'm sure it's got, oh, such beautiful things in it. Let's pretend the glass has got all soft like gauze so that we can get through. Why, it's turning into sort of a mist now, I declare. It'll be easy enough to get through. She was up on the chimney piece while she said this, and certainly the glass was beginning to melt away, just like a bright silvery mist. In another moment, Alice was through the glass and sat down on the mantelpiece in Looking Glass House. Oh, what fun it'll be when they see me through the glass in here and can't get at me. Here's a book. It's all in some language I don't know. Why, it's a looking glass book, of course. And if I hold it up to the glass, the words will go the right way again. Jabberwocky. <laughs> Twas brillig and the slithy toes Did gyre and gimble in the wave all mimsy were the borrow goes, and the moam rocks outgray. Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jubjub bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the manxome foe he sought. So rested he by the tum tum tree, and stood a while and thought. As an uppish thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whittling through the tulgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through the fork of blade went snicker snack. <laughs> he left it dead, and with its head he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, grabbed his day, kalu kale, he chortled in his joy. <laughs> Twas brillig and the slithy toves did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves and the moam rocks outgrave. Who is this coming? It was a white rabbit with pink eyes, splendidly dressed, trotting along in a great hurry, muttering to himself. Oh, my ears and whiskers, how late it's getting. Oh, dear, oh, dear, I shall be too late. Alice jumped down from the mantelpiece and started after the rabbit, but he disappeared as quickly as he came. There instead was a little door about 15 inches high, and near it on a table, a tiny golden key. Alice fitted the key in the door and found that it opened on a lovely garden. But alas, she couldn't even get her head through the tiny doorway. She said to herself, Oh, how I wish I could shut up like a telescope. And that is exactly what she did. 
By drinking from a bottle found on the table, Alice grew smaller and smaller till the tabletop was high above her head. I wonder if I'm going out altogether like a candle. Now she was just the right size to go through the door, but alas, she had left the key on top of the table and couldn't possibly reach it. Poor Alice. She started to cry, and she cried so hard that she suddenly found that she was up to her neck in a pool of her own tears. Just then she heard something splashing about in the pool a little way off, and she soon made out that it was only a mouse that had slipped in like herself. Would it be of any use now to speak to this mouse? Everything's so out of the way here that I should think very likely it can talk. Do you know the way out of this pool, old mouse? Perhaps he doesn't understand English. I dare say it's a French mouse come over with William the Conqueror. Who a ma chat? Oh, I beg your pardon. I quite forgot you didn't like cats. Would you like cats if you were me? Nasty, low, vulgar things. Don't let me hear the name again. I won't indeed. Uh, are you fond of, of dogs? No. Oh, dear, I'm afraid I've offended it again. Let us get to the shore, and then I'll tell you my history, and you'll understand why it is I hate cats and dogs. The pool was getting quite crowded with the birds and animals that had fallen into it. There was a duck and a dodo, a lorry and an eaglet, and several other curious creatures. Alice led the way, and the whole party swam to the shore. At last, the mouse called out, Sit down, all of you, and listen to me. This is the driest thing I know. <laughs> Silence all round, if you please. William the Conqueror, whose cause was favoured by the Pope, was soon submitted to by the English, who wanted leaders and had been of late much accustomed to usurpation and conquest. Edwin and Morcar, the Earls of Mercia and Northumbria. How are you getting on now, my dear? As wet as ever, it doesn't seem to dry me at all. Then the best thing to get us dry would be a caucus race. What is a caucus race, Mr. Dodo? Why, the best way to explain it is to do it. They began running when they liked and left off when they liked. The Dodo suddenly called out, The race is over. They all crowded round it, panting and asking, But who has won? Everybody has won, and all must have prizes. Oh, Mouse, you promised to tell me your history, you know, and why it is you hate C's and D's. Mine is a long and a sad tale. It is a long tale, certainly. But why do you call it sad? Oh, uh, Please don't be offended. Come back and tell us your story. Yes, please do. I shall do nothing of the sort. I wish I had our Dinah here. I know I do. She'd soon fetch it back. And who is Dinah? If I might venture to ask the question. Dinah's our cat. And she's such a capital one for catching mice, you can't think. And oh, I wish you could see her after the birds. Why, she'd eat a little bird as soon as look at it. Wow! This speech caused a remarkable sensation among the birds. I really must be getting home. The night air doesn't suit my throat. On various pretexts, they all moved off, and Alice was soon left alone. I wish I hadn't mentioned Dinah. Nobody seems to like her down here. And I'm sure she's the best cat in all the world. Oh, my dear Dinah, I wonder if I shall ever see you any more. Alice suddenly saw a large mushroom growing near her, about the same height as herself. She peeped over the edge, and her eyes met those of a large caterpillar. He was sitting on the top, smoking a long hookah. At last, he took the hookah out of his mouth, and addressed her. Who are you? I, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least I know who I was when I got up this morning. But I must have changed several times since then. So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Repeat, you are old Father William. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white. And yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain. But now that I'm perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you'd finish the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law, 
and argued each case with my wife, and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. That is not said right. Not quite right, I'm afraid. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from beginning to end. The caterpillar got down off the mushroom and crawled away into the grass, remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? Of the mushroom. And in another second, it was out of sight. Suddenly, a footman in livery came running out of the wood. He had a face just like a fish. He rapped loudly at the door with his knuckles. It was opened by another footman in livery, with a round face and round eyes like a frog. The fish footman produced a great letter. For the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. From the Queen, an invitation for the Duchess to play croquet. Then they both bowed low, and the fish footman went away again. Alice went up to the door and knocked. There's no sort of use in knocking, and that for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are. Secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one could possibly hear you. Please, then, how am I to get in? Are you to get in at all? That's the first question, you know. It's really dreadful the way these creatures argue. It's enough to drive one crazy. Uh, I shall sit here on and off. For days and days. But what am I to do? Anything you like. There's no use in talking to him. He's perfectly idiotic. The door led right into a large kitchen which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire stirring a large cauldron which seemed to be full of soup. Choo! There's certainly too much pepper in that soup. Please, would you tell me why your cat grins like that? It's a Cheshire cat, and that's why. Pig! She said the last word with such violence that Alice quite jumped. But she saw in another moment that it was addressed to the baby and not to her. The Duchess began singing a sort of lullaby to it and giving it a violent shake at the end of every line. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. I speak severely to my boy. I beat him when he sneezes for he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Here, you may nurse it for a bit if you like. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the queen. If I don't take this child away with me, they'll surely kill it in a day or two. Wouldn't it be murder to leave it behind? She looked down into its face. There could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig. So she set the little creature down and felt quite relieved to see it trot quietly away into the wood. If it had grown up, it would have been a dreadfully ugly child. But it makes a rather handsome pig, I think. Alice was a little startled by seeing the Cheshire cat sitting on a bough of a tree a few yards off. Meow. Cheshire puss, would you please tell me which way I ought to walk from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to. I don't much care where. Then it doesn't matter which way you walk. What sort of people live about here? To the left lives a hatter, to the right lives a march hare. Visit either you like. They're both mad. But I don't want to go among mad people. Oh, you can't help that. We're all mad here. <laughs> I'm mad, you're mad. How do you know I'm mad? You must be, or you wouldn't have come here. By the by, what became of the baby? It turned into a pig. Brrr, I thought it would. Meow. It vanished quite slowly, beginning with the end of the tail and ending with a grin, 
which remained for some time after the rest of it had gone. Well, I've often seen a cat without a grin, but a grin without a cat? It's the most curious thing I ever saw in all my life. Alice had not gone much further when she came in sight of the March Hare and the Hatter, having tea at a long table set out under a tree. A Dormouse was sitting between them, fast asleep. No room, no room. There's plenty of room. The Hatter had been looking at Alice with great curiosity. Your hair wants cutting. You should learn not to make personal remarks. It's very rude. Why is a raven like a writing desk? Come, we should have some fun now. I believe I can guess that. The Hatter had taken his watch out of his pocket and was looking at it uneasily, shaking it every now and then and holding it to his ear. What day of the month is it? The fourth. Ah, two days wrong. I told you butter wouldn't suit the works. The March Hare took the watch and looked at it gloomily. Then he dipped it into his cup of tea and looked at it again. Twas the best butter. Yes, but some crumbs must have got in as well. You shouldn't have put it in with a bread knife. What a funny watch. It tells the days of the month, but doesn't tell what o'clock it is. Why should it? Have you guessed the riddle yet? No, I give it up. What's the answer? I haven't the slightest idea. <laughs> I think you might do something better with the time than wasting it, asking riddles that have no answers. If you knew time as well as I do, you wouldn't talk about wasting it. It's him. I don't know what you mean. Oh, of course you don't. I dare say you never even spoke to time. Now, if you only kept on good terms with him, he'd do almost anything you liked with the clocks. Is that the way you manage? Not I. We quarreled last March, just before he went mad, you know. And ever since that, he won't do a thing, I ask. It's always six o'clock now. Is that the reason so many tea things are put out here? Yes, that's it. It's always tea time, and we've no time to wash the things between whiles. Then you keep moving around, I suppose. Exactly so, as the things get used up. What happens when you come to the beginning again? <laughs> Suppose we change the subject. I vote the young lady tell us a story. I'm afraid that I don't know one. Then, then the, the Dormouse door shall. Wake, wake up, up Dormouse. Door tell us a story. And be quick about it or you'll be asleep before it's done. Once upon a time, there were three little sisters and their names were Elsie, Lacey and Tilly and they lived at the bottom of a well. What did they live on? They lived on Treacle. Oh, they couldn't have done that, you know. They'd have been ill. So they were very ill. But why did they live at the bottom of a well? It was a treacle well. And so these three little sisters, they were learning to draw, you know. What did they draw? Treacle. But I don't understand. What did they draw the treacle from? You can draw water out of a water well, so I should think you could draw treacle out of a treacle well. Eh, hey, stupid? But they were in the well. Of course they were well in. They were learning to draw and they drew all manner of things. Everything that begins with an M, such as mousetraps and the moon and memory and muchness. You know you say things are much of a muchness. Did you ever see such a thing as a drawing of a muchness? Really, now you ask me, I don't think... Then you shouldn't talk. <laughs> this piece of rudeness was more than Alice could bear. She got up in great disgust and walked off. At any rate, I'll never go there again. It's the stupidest tea party I ever was at in all my life. Alice very soon came upon the Griffon lying fast asleep in the sun. She didn't quite like the look of the creature. The Griffon sat up and rubbed its eyes. Ooh, ho, ho. Have you seen the mock turtle yet? I don't even know what a mock turtle is. Why, well, it's the thing mock turtle soup's made from. Come on. I never was so ordered about in all my life. Never. They hadn't gone far before they saw the mock turtle sitting sad and lonely on a little ledge of rock, sighing as if his heart would break. What is his sorrow? It's all his fancy, that. He hasn't got no sorrow, you know. Come on. <clears throat> This here young lady, she wants for to know your history. I'll tell it her. Once I was a real turtle. When we were little, we went to school in the sea. The master was an old turtle. We used to call him Tortoise. Why did you call him Tortoise if he wasn't one? We called him Tortoise because he taught us. Really, you're very dull. And how many hours a day did you do lessons? Ten hours the first day, nine the next, and so on. What a curious plan. That's the reason they're called lessons, because they lessen from day to day. You may not have lived much under the sea, and perhaps you were never introduced to a lobster. I once tasted... Hmm? 
No, never. So you can have no idea what a delightful thing a lobster quadrille is. Come, let's try the first figure. Will you walk a little faster, said the whiting to the snail. There's a porpoise close behind me and he's treading on my tail. See how eagerly the lobsters and the turtles all advance. They are waiting on the shingle. Will you come and join the dance? Will you, won't you? Will you, won't you? Will you join the dance? Will you, won't you? Will you, won't you? Won't you join the dance? Thank you. It's a very interesting dance to watch. But if I'd been the whiting, I'd have said to the porpoise, Keep back, please. We don't want you with us. Uh, <clears throat> they were obliged to have him. No wise fish would go anywhere without a porpoise. Wouldn't it really? Of course not. Why, if a fish came to me and told me he was going on a journey, I should say, with what porpoise? Don't you mean purpose? I mean what I say. Uh, would you like the mock turtle to sing your song? Oh, yes, please, if he would be so kind. Sing a turtle soup, will you, old fella? <laughs> Beautiful soup, so rich and green, waiting in a hot tureen. Oh, for such dainties would not stop. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Beautiful soup, who cares for fish, game, or any other dish? Who would not give all else for two? Any worth only a beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, beautiful soup. Soup of the evening, Suddenly, the white rabbit came to Alice in great agitation, shouting... The trial's beginning! The trial's beginning! The trial's beginning! What trial is it? Come on! When they arrived in the courtroom, the king and queen of hearts were seated on their throne. The king was presiding as judge. A great crowd of all sorts of birds and beasts were assembled about them, as well as a whole pack of cards. The knave was standing before them in chains, with a soldier on each side to guard him. Near the king was the white rabbit, dressed as a herald with a trumpet in one hand and a scroll of parchment in the other. In the very middle of the court was a table with a large dish of tarts upon it. I wish they'd get the trial done hand round the refreshments. That's the judge because of his great wig. And that's the jury box. And I suppose those creatures are the jurors. Silence in the court, herald. Read the accusation. The queen of hearts, she made some tarts all on a summer day. The knave of hearts, he stole those tarts and took them quite away. Consider your verdict. Well, not yet, not yet. There's a great deal more to come before that, Your Majesty. This paper has just been picked up. It's a set of verses. Are they in the prisoner's handwriting? Well, no, they're not, Your Majesty, and that's the queerest thing about it. That proves his guilt. It oh, proves wait. nothing of the sort. Why, you don't even know what they're about. Read them. Where shall I begin, please, Your Majesty? Begin at the beginning. Go on till you come to the end. Then stop. They told me you had been to her and mentioned me to him. She gave me a good character but said I could not swim. 
He sent them word I had not gone, we know it to be true. If she should push the matter on, what would become of you? I gave her one, they gave him two, you gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. I gave her one, they gave him two, you gave us three or more. They all returned from him to you, though they were mine before. If I or she should chance to be involved in this affair, he trusts to you to set them free exactly as we were. He trusts to you to set them free exactly as we were. My notion was that you had been before she had this fit, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it. Before she had this fit, before she had this fit, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it, an obstacle that came between him and ourselves and it. Don't let him know she liked him best, for this must ever be a secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me, for this must ever be. For this must ever be A secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me A secret kept from all the rest between yourself and me A secret kept from all the rest A secret kept from all the rest A secret kept, a secret kept from all the rest and me That's the most important piece of evidence we've heard yet So now let the jury... If any of them can explain it, I'll give them a sixpence I don't believe there's an atom of meaning in it she doesn't believe there's an atom of meaning in it. What do you know about this business? Nothing. Nothing whatever? Nothing whatever. That's very important. Unimportant, Your Majesty means, of course. Unimportant, of course I meant. Important, unimportant, important, unimportant, imp, um, uh, unimportant, of course I meant. Consider your verdict. No, no! Sentence first! Verdict afterwards! down upon her. She gave a little scream, half of fright and half of anger, and tried to beat them off. Then she started to run, and soon left the king and queen of hearts and all the cards far behind her. She ran for a long time until she was quite tired, and when she slowed up, she found herself in a most curious country, marked out just like a chessboard. Alice heard footsteps thump, thump along the gravel walk, and in a minute she found herself face to face with a red chess queen. Where do you come from and where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers. You see, I've lost my way. I don't know what you mean by your way. All the ways about here belong to me. Curtsy, while you're thinking what to say, it saves time. I'll try it when I go home the next time I'm a little late for dinner. It's time for you to answer now. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak. And always say, Your Majesty. I only wanted to see what the garden was like, Your Majesty. That's right. Though when you say garden, I've seen gardens compared with which this would be a wilderness. And I thought I'd try and find my way to the top of that hill. When you say hill, I could show you hills in comparison with which you call that a valley. No, I shouldn't. A hill can't be a valley, you know. That would be nonsense. You may call it nonsense if you like. But I've heard nonsense compared with which that would be as sensible as a dictionary. I declare it's marked out just like a huge chessboard. It's a great huge game of chess that's being played all over the world. Oh, what fun it is. I wouldn't mind being a pawn if only I might join. Though, of course, I should like to be queen, Bess. That's easily managed. You can be the white queen's pawn if you like, and you're in the second square to begin with. When you get to the eighth square, you'll be a queen. Suddenly, they were running hand in hand. Faster, faster. The queen went so fast, it was all Alice could do to keep up with her. I wonder if all things move along with us. Faster, don't try to talk. Faster, faster. Are we nearly there? Nearly there? Why, we passed it ten minutes ago. 
Faster, faster. You may rest a little now. Why, I do believe we've been under this tree the whole while. Everything's just as it was. Well, of course it is. What would you have it? Well, in our country, you'd generally get somewhere else if you'd run very fast as we've been doing. Sure, a slow sort of country. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. I'd rather not try, please. I'm quite content to stay where I am. Only I am so hot and thirsty. Mm, I know what you'd like. Have a biscuit. While you're refreshing yourself, I'll just take the measurements. A pawn goes two squares in its first move, you know. So you'll go very quickly through the third square, by railway, I should think. And you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Have another biscuit. No, thank you. One's quite enough. First quenched, I hope. The fifth square is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty. But you make no remark. I didn't know I had to make one just then. You should have said. It's extremely kind of you to tell me all this. However, we'll suppose it said. The seventh square is all forest. However, one of the knights will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall be queens together. And it's all feasting and fun. Speak in French when you can't think of the English for a thing. Turn out your toes as you walk and remember who you are. She can run very fast. Goodbye. Whether she vanished into the air or whether she ran quickly into the wood, there was no way of guessing, but she was gone. It was getting dark so suddenly that Alice thought there must be a thunderstorm coming on. There was quite a hurricane in the wood. Oh, here's somebody's shawl being blown off. I'm glad I happened to be in the way. She caught the shawl as she spoke and looked about for the owner. In another moment, the White Queen came running wildly through the wood with both arms stretched out wide as if she were flying. And Alice very civilly went to meet her with the shawl. The white chess queen only looked at her in a helpless, frightened sort of way and kept repeating something in a whisper to herself that sounded like bread and butter, bread and butter, bread and butter. Am I addressing the white queen? Well, yes, if that's what you call addressing. It isn't my notion of the thing at all. Well, if your majesty will only tell me the right way to begin, I'll do it as well as I can. But I don't want it done at all. I've been addressing myself for the last two hours. Every single thing's crooked and she's all over pins. May I put your shawl straight for you? Oh, I don't know what's the matter with it. It's out of temper, I think. I've pinned it here and I've pinned it there. Ah, there's no pleasing it. It can't go straight, you know, if you pin it all to one side. And dear me, what a state your hair is in. The brush has got entangled in it. And I lost the comb yesterday. There, come. You look rather better now. Really, you should have a lady's maid. Oh, I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure. Tuppence a week and jam every other day. I don't want you to hire me, and I don't care for jam. Oh, it's very good jam. Well, at any rate, I don't want any today. Well, you couldn't have it today if you did want it. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. It must come sometimes to jam today. No, it can't. It's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. I don't understand. It's dreadfully confusing. Ah, that's the effect of living backward. Always makes one a little giddy at first. Living backward? I never heard of such a thing. But there's one great advantage in it, that one's memory works both ways. Oh, I'm sure mine only works one way. I can't remember things before they happen. <laughs> it's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. What sort of things do you remember best? Oh, things that happened the week after next. For instance, now, there's the king's messenger. He's in prison now, being punished. And the trial doesn't even begin till next Wednesday. And, of course, the crime comes last of all. Suppose he never commits the crime. Well, that would be all the better, wouldn't it? Of course it would be all the better, but it wouldn't be all the better his being punished. You're wrong there, at any rate. Were you ever punished? Only for faults. And you were all the better for it, I know. Yes, but then I had done the things I was punished for. That makes all the difference. Yes, but if you hadn't done them, that would have been better still. Better and better and better. My fingers bleeding. 
What is the matter? Have you pricked your finger? No, I haven't pricked it yet, but I soon shall. When do you expect to do it? When I fasten my shawl again, the brooch will come undone directly. Oh, take care. You're holding it all crooked. (gasps) There, now you've pricked it. Ah, that accounts for the bleeding, you see. Now you understand the way things happen here. But why don't you scream now? Well, I've done all the screaming already. What would be the good of having it all over again? I'm glad it's getting lighter. I thought it was the night coming on. Oh, I wish I could manage to be glad. Only I never can remember the rule. You must be very happy. Living in this wood and being glad whenever you like. Only it's so very lonely here. Ah, don't go on like that. Consider what a great girl you are. Consider what a long way you've come today. Consider what a clock it is. Consider anything. Only don't cry. Can you keep from crying by considering things? Well, that's the way it's done. Nobody can do two things at once, you know. Now, let's consider your age to begin with. How old are you? I'm seven and a half exactly. Oh, you needn't say exactly. I can believe it without that. Now, I'll give you something to believe. I am just 101, five months, and a day. Oh, I can't believe that. Can't you? (laughs) Try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. (laughs) There's no use trying. One can't believe in possible things, you know. Oh, I dare say you haven't had much practice. When I was your age, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've managed to believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Ah, there goes the shawl again. I've got it. Now you shall see me pin it on again all by myself. Then I hope your finger's better now. Oh, much better, much better. The queen spread out her arms again and went flying away on a gust of wind. Alice found herself in the sixth square, and sure enough, there was Humpty Dumpty sitting on the top of a high wall. Why, it's Humpty Dumpty himself. It can't be anybody else. How exactly like an egg he is. It's very provoking to be called an egg, very. I said you looked like an egg, sir. Some eggs are very pretty, you know. Some people have no more sense than a baby. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great ball. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty Dumpty back in his place again. That last line's much too long for the poetry. Don't stand there chattering to yourself like that, but tell me your name and your business. My name is Alice, but... It's a stupid name enough. What does it mean? Must a name mean something? Of course it must. My name means the shape I am, and a good handsome shape it is, too. With a name like yours, you might be any shape, almost. Why do you sit out here all alone? Why? Because there's nobody with me. Did you think I didn't know the answer to that? Ask another. Don't you think you'd be safer on the ground? That wall is very narrow. What tremendously easy riddles you ask. Of course I don't think so. Why, if ever I did fall off, which there's no chance of, but if I did, if I did fall, the king has promised me... To send all his horses and all his men. No, I declare that's too bad. You've been listening at doors and behind trees and down chimneys, or you couldn't have known it. I haven't indeed. It's in a book. What a beautiful belt you've got on. At least a beautiful cravat, I should have said. (laughs) No belt, I mean. Oh, I beg your pardon. Only I knew which was neck and which was waist. It is a most provoking thing when a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. I know it's very ignorant of me. It's a cravat, child. And a beautiful one, as you say. It's a present from the white king and queen. There, now. Is it really? They gave it me. They gave it me for an unbirthday present. I beg your pardon? I'm not offended. I mean, what is an unbirthday present? A present given when it isn't your birthday, of course. I like birthday presents best. You don't know what you're talking about. How many days are there in the year? 365. And how many birthdays have you? One. And if you take one from 365, what remains? 364, of course. And that shows there are 364 days when you might get unbirthday presents. Certainly. And only one for birthday presents, you know. 
There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory. Of course you don't till I tell you. I meant there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Impenetrability, that's what I say. You seem very clever at explaining words, sir. Would you kindly tell me the meaning of a poem called Jabberwocky? Ah, as to poetry, you know, I can repeat poetry as well as other folk if it comes to that. Oh, it needn't come to that. The piece I'm going to repeat was written entirely for your amusement. I sent a message to the fish. I told them this is what I wish. The little fish's answer was, we cannot do it, sir, because... I'm afraid I don't quite understand. It gets easier further on. I took a corkscrew from the shelf. I went to wake them up myself. And when I found the door was locked, I pulled and pushed and kicked and knocked. And when I found the door was shut, I tried to turn the handle... But Is that all? That's all. Goodbye. Alice waited a minute to see if he would speak again, but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her, she said, Of all the unsatisfactory people, of all the unsatisfactory people I've ever met. At this moment, her thoughts were interrupted by a loud shouting. Ahoy! Ahoy, Jack! Ahoy! Ahoy, Jack! And Alice looked round in some surprise. It was the white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse right at her feet. May I help you off with your helmet? Now one can breathe more easily. I see you're admiring me little box. It's my own invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry it upside down so that the rain can't get in. But the things can get out. Do you know the lid's open? I didn't know it. Then all the things must have fallen out. Is that a beehive you have fastened to your saddle? Yes, it's a very good beehive, one of the best kind. But not a single bee has come near it yet. And the other thing is a mouse trap. I suppose the mice keep the bees out, or the bees keep the mice out. I don't know which. I was wondering what the mousetrap was for. Is it very likely there would be any mice on the horse's back? Not very likely, perhaps. But if they do come, I don't choose to have them running all about. And now help me on. I must be on my way. I hope you've got your hair well fastened on. Only in the usual way. That's hardly enough. You see, the wind is so very strong here. It's as strong as soup. The poor knight certainly was not a good rider. Whenever the horse stopped, he fell off in front. And whenever it went on again, he fell off behind. It's too ridiculous. You ought to have a horse on wheels, that you ought. Does that kind go smoothly? (laughs) Yes. I'll get one. One or two. Several. And here I must leave you. Oh, you're sad. Let me sing you a song to comfort you. Is it very long? It's long, but it's very, very beautiful. Everybody that hears me sing it, either it brings tears to their eyes, or else... Or else what? Or else it doesn't, you know. The song is called A Sitting on a Gate, and the tune's me own invention. I'll tell thee everything I can. There's little to relate. I saw an aged, aged man a sitting on a gate. He said, I look for butterflies that sleep among the wheat. I make them into mutton pies and sell them in the street. But I was thinking of a way to feed oneself on batter and so go on from day to day. Getting a little better. I thanked him much for telling me the way he got his wealth, but chiefly for his wish that he might drink my noble health. And now if ever by chance I put my fingers into glue, or madly squeeze a left hand foot into a right hand shoe, or if I drop upon my toe a very heavy weight, 
I weep, for it reminds me so of that old man I used to know, whose look was mild, whose speech was slow, whose hair was whiter than the snow, whose face was very like a crow, with eyes like cinders all aglow, who seemed distracted with his bow and rocked his body to and fro and muttered mumblingly and low, as if his mouth were full of dough. Who snorted like a buffalo? That summer evening long ago, a sitting on a gate. And now I must leave you. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. I think it'll encourage me, you see. Of course I'll wait. Thank you for the song. I liked it very much. I hope so, but you didn't cry as much as I thought you would. The night rode slowly into the forest. Alice waved her handkerchief to him and waited till he was out of sight. I hope it encouraged him. Everything was happening so oddly that Alice didn't feel a bit surprised at finding the Red Queen and the White Queen sitting close to her, one on each side. She felt something very heavy on her head. She put up her hands and lifted it off. It was a golden crown. Well, this is grand. I never expected to be queen so soon. But if I really am a queen, I should be able to manage it quite well in time. You can't be a queen till you've passed the proper examination. And the sooner we begin it, the better. But, Your Red Majesty, I didn't mean that... That's just what I complain of. You should have meant. What do you suppose is the use of a child without any meaning? Even a joke should have some meaning. And a child's more important than a joke, I hope. You couldn't deny that, even if you tried with both hands. I don't deny things with my hands. Nobody said you did. I said you couldn't if you tried. She's in that state of mind when she wants to deny something, only she doesn't know what to deny. A nasty, vicious temper. Eesh. I invite your white majesty to Alice's dinner party this afternoon. And I invite you. Mm -hmm. If there is to be a party, I think I ought to invite the guests. We gave you the opportunity of doing it. But I dare say you've not had many lessons in manners yet. Manners are not taught in lessons. Lessons teach you to do sums and things of that sort. Can you do addition? What's one and 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 one? I don't know. I lost count. She can't do addition. Can you do subtraction? Take a bone from a dog. What remains? The bone wouldn't remain, of course, if I took it. And the dog wouldn't remain. It would come to bite me. I'm sure I shouldn't remain. Then you think nothing would remain? I think that's the answer. Wrong as usual. The dog's temper would remain. But I don't see how. Why, look here. The dog would lose its temper, wouldn't it? Perhaps it would. Then if the dog went away, its temper would remain. They might go different ways. What dreadful nonsense we are talking. She She can't can't do sums sums a a bit. Can you answer useful questions? How is bread made? I know that. You take some flour. Where do you pick the flour? In the garden or in the hedges? Well, it isn't picked at all. It's ground. How many acres of ground? You mustn't leave out so many things. Do you know languages? What's the French for fiddle-dee-dee? Fiddle-dee-dee's not English. Whoever said it was. If you'll tell me what language fiddle-dee-dee is, I'll tell you the French for it. Queens never make bargains. I wish queens never asked questions. Now, don't let us quarrel. What is the cause of lightning? The cause of lightning is the thunder. No, no, I meant the other way. It's too late to correct it. When you've once said a thing, that fixes it, and you must take the consequences. Which reminds me, we had such a thunderstorm last Tuesday. I mean, one of the last set of Tuesdays, you know. In our country, there's only one day at a time. (laughs) That's a poor, thin way of doing things. Now, here we mostly have days and nights two or three at a time. Sometimes, in the winter, we take as many as five nights together for warmth, you know. It was such a thunderstorm, you can't think. She never could, you know. Part of the roof came off, ever so much thunder got in, and it went rolling about the room in great lumps and knocking over the tables and things. Fly was so frightened, I 
I couldn't remember my own name. Mm, Your Majesty must excuse her. She means well, but she can't help saying foolish things as a general rule. A little kindness and putting her hair in papers would do wonders with her. Oh, I am so sleepy. Mm, She's tired, poor thing. Smooth her hair, lend her your nightcap, and sing her a soothing lullaby. I haven't a nightcap with me, and I don't know any soothing lullabies. Ah, I must do it myself, then. Hush a by Lady in Alice's lap. Till the feast ready, we've time for a nap. When the feast over, we'll go to the ball. Red Queen and White Queen and Alice and all. Now that you know the words, just sing it over to me. I'm getting sleepy too. What am I to do? Wake up, you heavy thing! The two queens had vanished, and Alice was standing before an arched doorway over which were the words, Queen Alice. She opened the door and found herself in a large hall. There were about 50 guests of all kinds. There were three chairs at the head of the table. The red and white queens had already taken two of them, but the middle one was empty. Alice sat down in it, rather uncomfortable at the silence and longing for someone to speak. At last, the red queen began. You missed the soup and fish. Put on the joint. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to that leg of mutton. Mutton, Alice. Alice, mutton. The leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice. And Alice returned the bow, not knowing whether to be frightened or amused. May I give you a slice? Certainly not. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. What impertinence. I wonder how you'd like it if I were to cut a slice out of you, you creature. Make a remark. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the mutton. Remove the joint. And the waiters carried it off and brought a large plum pudding in its place. Oh, I won't be introduced to the pudding, please, or we shall have no dinner at all. May I give you some? Pudding, Alice, Alice, pudding, remove the pudding. And the waiters took it away so quickly that Alice couldn't return its bow. And now we must drink your health. Queen Alice's health. Queen Alice's health. You ought to return thanks in a neat speech. We must support you, you know. Good keep us world, it was Alice that said I was scepter in hand. I have a crown on my head that let her look in glass breeches, whatever they be. Come and dine with the red queen, the white queen and me. So fill up the glasses as quick as you can. And spring from the table with buttons and bran. Put cats in the coffee and mice in the tea. And welcome Queen Alice with thirty times three. With thirty times three. With thirty times three. And welcome Queen Alice with thirty times three. something like a bed of rushes with fireworks at the top. As to the bottles, they each took a pair of plates, which they hastily fitted on as wings, and so with forks for legs, went fluttering about in all directions. There was the most dreadful confusion. Alice turned fiercely upon the Red Queen, whom she considered as the cause of all the mischief. But the Queen was no longer at her side. She had suddenly dwindled down to the size of a little doll. Alice caught hold of her 
and started to shake her, crying, And as for you, and as for you, I'll shake you into a kitten, that I will. She took her off the table as she spoke and shook her backwards and forwards with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance whatever, only her face grew very small and her eyes got large and green and still as Alice went on shaking her, she kept on growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder. Alice sat up and rubbed her eyes. It really was a kitten, after all. And there was Alice curled up in the big armchair. She looked round the familiar room and smiled to herself. Why, what a curious dream. <laughs>